Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Hey, good morning to you. You're looking good. And that was great. That was great. So let's, let's thank these folks in the worship band. That was excellent. Derek and the team, good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I, I just want to echo uh, Lou Ann's words. We're delighted to have you here this morning. Thanks so much for coming out. Uh, you know, last week, big week here at Faith Bridge, we had Adventure Sunday. Celebrate Father's Day, uh, the very last, uh, very last day of, of VBS. And uh, just we had uh, folks visiting in both services. It was exciting. We had the kids in here singing. Uh, we had a highlight video from VBS. Uh, uh, and, uh, and barbecue, barbecue, I mean, had the barbecue last week. Yeah, that was awesome. Just, uh, and, and to top off the excitement, this was cool. We actually released a boa constrictor right here in the sanctuary. That's not true. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, anyway, it was a fantastic week. I hope, I hope that uh, you didn't miss it. Uh, and by the way, if you did visit last week, um, and you've come back this week, uh, let me just uh, say again, as Luann did, we would love to meet you. Please stop by the party on the patio. Uh, so we can greet you and uh, and give you a welcome packet and 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 maybe a, a baby boa constrictor. So uh, yeah, our VBS theme this year. I don't know if you picked up on this last week, but our VBS theme this year was God the Deliverer, God the Deliverer. And we talked about how God delivers us from our sin, from our from our selfishness, from our fear, from our from our worries. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and as I thought about that promise this week and, and some of the practical ways it, it plays out um, in everyday life, I decided uh, I want to spend another Sunday. I want to spend another Sunday on this, on this idea that God is a deliverer. God is our deliverer. So this morning, if you have a Bible, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, if you just put your hand up in the air, uh, we have some folks, even now, who are walking down the aisle, and uh, if you just raise your hand, they're going to place a Bible uh, in it. And uh, we'd love to have you follow along. We can all be on the same page, and uh, just accept that as a gift from us. So just put your hand up there, keep it up. We'll make sure you have a Bible. If you have that Bible, uh, open it to the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. If you're not used to kind of thumbing through a Bible, uh, that's the very first book in the New Testament, the very first of the four Gospels, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter six. And we're going to read some very, very familiar words beginning in verse seven. We'll put it up on the screen so that uh, you you can follow along. And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Let's, let's, let's read this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Yeah, that, that, that verse 13, I want us to just zoom in on that. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us uh, from evil. You know, it's one thing for us to talk to our kids uh, to, to celebrate with the children the fact that God is a deliverer. That's, that's fantastic. But if we're not careful, uh, we will sort of blow past that truth without taking the time to reflect on how that truth might impact our own lives. There's not one person in this room this morning, I don't care how old you are, maybe you're in your 70s or 80s, maybe you're a teenager, maybe you just uh, graduated uh, this year, maybe you're middle-aged, maybe you're uh, you know, somewhere in between in there. If we could begin to kind of wrap our brain around this notion that our God is a deliverer and a rescuer, not, not, not just empty phrases to kind of use Jesus's words, not just empty phrases, but good news, 
Good news of gracious rescue that echoes in our families and, and, and in our relationships and, and in our jobs and, and, uh, and, and, and stuff we're doing at camp this summer and, and all of that stuff, that would make an impact. And so I want us this morning uh, to take a few minutes uh, to look at, specifically in Matthew chapter 6 at this last verse of this well-known prayer. Um, because here Jesus himself points us explicitly to God, our Father, the Deliverer, the Deliverer. Now, um, I, I know that uh, most of us in the room probably feel like we have a pretty good sense of the Lord's Prayer. We, we recite it enough. Um, whenever I think about the Lord's Prayer, I remember as a little kid, um, you know, we would do this every Sunday, every Sunday. And I remember as a little kid, I would watch the adults stand up and they would go through this stuff. And and of course, as a little kid, I had no clue what the heck they were talking about. I just knew that this was kind of like important stuff that they were saying to God. And, and, and I think most of us get this, that in church there, there is kind of that, that part of the, the lingo that if you don't know it, you're kind of, you're a little bit on the outs. You know, I, I remember as a little kid, like our preacher would say, we need to be consecrated. I kind of look at my mom and dad and say, why would you want to be constipated? And, and, uh, and then I looked around the sanctuary, I go, no. No, they do look constipated. And, and, uh, but, uh, but I, I, you know, you don't, a lot of these words, if you're not used to it, you don't really, you don't really know. And the great thing about being a little kid, the great thing about being a child, of course, a little boy, is when you don't know stuff like that, you just make up stuff, right? You just make up, you, like, like I, I would pray like our father who art in New Haven. How do you know my name? Right? <laughs> Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us some email. I mean, you know, you just, just kind of make up. Like one time in church, I got very excited. I stood up and went, hallelujah. <laughs> but but, but, but may, maybe that's your deal this morning. Maybe you're here and you're visiting and you go, well, I don't know. To me, it just seems like kind of a, uh, uh, some kind of spiritual hallmark card, just, just empty phrases. Um, I, I want us to listen carefully to these words this morning because uh, I want you to understand. I want us together to begin to grasp the idea that God is our rescuer. God is our rescuer. Now, <clears throat> let me just say by way of an overview that, that the Lord's Prayer is almost exactly in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. Don't know if you ever noticed that. The Sermon on the Mount begins in chapter 5 of Matthew, concludes in chapter 7 of Matthew. The Lord's Prayer is almost right exactly in the middle. In fact, um, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, in the Greek New Testament, there are actually 116 lines of text before the Lord's Prayer. And after the Lord's Prayer, there are 114 lines of text. So it's right smack in the, and it's like the Lord kind of wants us to understand, hey, this is at the heart of the life I am calling you to. And it's pretty clear when you read through these words in the Lord's Prayer that it's divided um, kind of into two uh, symmetrical uh, parts. The first part, um, we see three petitions, and each of those three petitions uh, use the word your, right? So we've got hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then there's the second section of the prayer uh, where three times the word us, three times the word us is used. Give us our bread, uh, forgive us our sin, and lead us not into temptation. Now this morning, we're just gonna focus on one of those petitions, the sixth and the final petition right there in verse 13. Lead us not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. Now, I should also mention that there are actually two separate accounts of the Lord's Prayer uh, in the Gospels. Um, uh, of course, they're, they're pretty much uh, identical, but there are some very small variations. One, for example, one version that we're given in Luke chapter 11, verse 4, uh, this sixth petition is in a very, very abbreviated form. It simply says, it simply says uh, lead us not into temptation. There's, there's nothing else about deliver us. It's just lead us not into temptation. In the passage you read this morning in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, we see the more kind of expanded version. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And when you look at this text, when you look at this passage of scripture, right off the bat, <clears throat> you're kind of faced with an obvious question. At least I think so. And the question is simply this. Why in the world are we asking God not to lead us into temptation? 
Like, why, why do we have to ask God not to lead us into temptation? I mean, for crying out loud, just, we spent the whole last week teaching the kids that God is a deliverer. And now we read this and I say, yeah, he's a deliverer. And if you don't ask him politely, he's going to deliver you into temptation. And, and, and it just seems kind of wacko. It, it, I mean, it, it's, uh, I'm reading this thing, but I hope the VBS kids don't get wind of this because it, it's a little disheartening, right? It, it's, it, it's like asking your doctor not to make you eat fried food uh, or, or, or pleading with your wife not to say no to a dinner out. It just, it just you go, wait a minute, why do we have to ask? Pray to God, lead us not into temptation. Why do we have to ask God? Please lead us not. That, that, that sounds like unless we ask him politely not to, God sort of gets his kicks by, by, by leading us into temptation so that he can punish us for giving into temptation. It just doesn't seem to kind of fit. I don't know if you heard the story down here. Um, there was a, a news story that came out in March. <clears throat> there were these two firemen up in, Vol up in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And uh, they were arrested because they had actually uh, set fire uh, to the firehouse. To the firehouse. I mean, j j now that, that's a little disappointing, right? Because, because you would hope, you would hope, you would not have to ask your firemen not to commit arson. Uh, but, 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 but if you do commit arson, please don't burn down our fire station. I mean, it just seems like, why are we having to ask these kinds of questions? And when you read Matthew 6, 13, first time through, it's like our father in heaven, please don't, please don't make us disobey you. It, it just doesn't seem to make sense. But if you look deeply uh, into this text, you start to realize that maybe, maybe it's not as odd as it first appears. Um, most of you probably know, for example, that, uh, that my real job is a college professor. Um, for 35 years, I've been teaching youth ministry at Eastern University, which is in the western suburbs of Philadelphia. In fact, this year, uh, I have actually taken a new job that will start uh, July 1st. Uh, at Grove City College in Grove City, Pennsylvania, where, again, I'll be teaching uh, youth ministry. And I, I love that job, but, but let, let's just fast forward a little bit because let, let's suppose it's now the fall, first semester of our brand new school year, and, uh, and we're coming up on our very first test. And, and my students are getting nervous because you know, this could be difficult and we don't really know this guy. And, and so let, let's say I'm approached by a student and the student says to me, um, uh, uh, Professor Robbins, although they never call me that, it's always Duffy. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's not funny. They go, they go uh, Duffy, uh, you know, they, I suppose I say, Duffy, please don't make me fail this test. Please don't make me fail this test. Now, now, uh, in one sense, that, that sounds kind of odd. Sounds like I'm this kind of evil schemer who, who sort of loves to, to disappoint uh, young students and require them to pay additional tuition as they repeat courses. And I'll be the first to say, sometimes I, if they haven't done a good job and the work is sloppy, I do like doing that. I mean, I had a guy say to me one time, how come you gave me an F? I said, because the school won't let us give G's. But, but I, let me tell you something. In a sense, in a sense, when, when, when they're asking me that question, um, they're, they're simply saying, you know what, Duffy, please don't make this test any more difficult than necessary, right? So in other words, they're not necessarily saying something about me when they make that plea. They're kind of saying something uh, about themselves. They're saying, look, I know your tests are hard. And, and I'm not kidding myself. I'm, I'm not so arrogant as to think I can just pull this off easily. I, I, I'm going to ask you for mercy because I, I could do badly on this thing. In other words, what we need to understand in verse 13 is that the negative request doesn't necessarily automatically imply sort of a positive accusation against God. And we pray to God. Lead us not into temptation. That, that doesn't necessarily imply that the father is kind of this, uh, you know, temptation puppet master who takes delight in pranking human beings, uh, uh, you know, who, who, who don't protect themselves by, by praying verse 13 of the Lord's Prayer. And remember, this is a prayer. This is so important. Remember, this is a prayer that begins with two key words. What are those two key words? 
our Father. Our Father. You see, that reminds us that, that, that we always begin the story with the assumption that whatever it is, whatever it is God's leading us into, he's leading it into us the way a father leads his child. The entire prayer flows out of that, that premise and that, that promise. It's he is our father. And, and let me just say this morning, you know, if you are ever at a loss for prayer. Let, let's just say you are in a very, very dark place. You are lonely. You are, you are scared. You are worried. You're wracked by, by, by doubt or, or by whatever it is. And you don't think you can pray anything else. Just pray those two words. Those two words. Just pray, just pray, my father, my father. And in doing that, you'll be paying precisely the prayer that Jesus prayed from the cross at his lowest point. My God, my God, just start there. Because once you begin to understand he's your father, that kind of brings everything else in a much clearer focus. And, and also don't forget, in the two previous petitions in the Lord's Prayer, right? One, uh, God invites us to pray for our daily bread. The second, he invites us to pray for forgiveness. It's, it's pretty clear that the Lord wants us to understand this is a God who gives, a God who forgives, and, and that we can trust him. In fact, I, I, I like the way James puts it in uh, chapter 1, verse 13 of his letter. He says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. He tempts no one. Plus, I'll, I'll tell you something else. Uh, this prayer makes even more sense uh, when you recognize that there's actually more than one way to translate the word rendered in verse 13 as temptation, that word temptation. Uh, it, I, I don't like to talk about Greek words a lot, but, but this is an interesting Greek word, pyrosmu or pyrosmon, uh, because you can actually translate it as temptation. You can translate it as temptation. And it means what we think it means when we say temptation. That's, that's precisely the way it's used in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 13, when Satan, remember this, uh, uh, met Jesus, confronted Jesus out in the wilderness. They had this big showdown. And uh, the scripture literally says that Satan pyrosmon, pyrosmood, he, he tempted Jesus. But it can also be translated as testing, testing, as in, as in something God does, not to, not to weaken us, but to strengthen us, to kind of build us up, to grow and to stretch our, our faith. And that's, in fact, precisely the way it's used uh, in James chapter 1. Some of you remember this, where, where James writes in verse 2, the testing, the pyrosmu of our faith can actually have positive results. In fact, James even says in chapter 1, count it a joy. Count it a joy when you meet various testings or various trials, pyrosmu. So, so that, that's good news. That's good. We can breathe a little deeper, you know, knowing that this is not a picture of us pleading with God uh, not to somehow trick us into temptation. Except not so fast. Because we need to recognize that just as testing can have a positive effect, testing can also have a negative effect. I proved this convincingly in high school. Uh, all you have to do is look at my report cards. Uh, you think about this. Um, let's, let's go back a minute to my role as a professor so that uh, now I am the tester and no longer the testee. And I'm giving a test to my students. Um, and, and I'm doing this because I love them and I care about them and I wanna stretch them, I wanna challenge them to grow. But unintentionally, I make the test so hard that, that, that some of them feel compelled to cheat. Some of them feel compelled to maybe cheat a little bit. And, 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 and so in that sense, uh, I have actually brought about a negative effect. And so, and so the question is, am I the one leading them into temptation? Now, no, but maybe yes, right? It sort of depends on their response to my leading. In other words, when we pray to God, lead us not into testing. Lead us not into testing. We're recognizing that, that left to our own resources, we're weak, that, that, that we can be easily duped, and, and we're, not, we're not fully prepared for the test. So we pray in humility, 
Lord, lead us not. Father, lead us not into testing. Reassure that our Father leads us and he loves us. The Father loves and leads his own child. And in a sense, when we pray these words, lead us not into temptation, we are admitting, we are confessing to God, we know we got a problem. We, we, we need a deliverer. We need a rescuer. And this is where Jesus gives us that great promise a little bit later on in the Gospel of John, uh, where, where he reminds us that this rescuer, this deliverer is not just a God who comes alongside us, but by his Holy Spirit, he lives inside us. He lives inside us. Now, uh, I think all of us in here are honest enough or hopefully self-aware enough to recognize that, uh, that we are left to our own abilities pretty helpless uh, to, to live a life of faith. We're weak, we're, we're, uh, we, we, we just don't have it in us. We, we do have a tendency to cheat on the test. We, we do have a tendency to play it safe. We do have a tendency to put ourselves... First, there's only one way any of us in this room could ever live the Christian life, and that is if Christ is in us. Uh, I remember the guy that discipled me, uh, he used to always say, Duffy, that's why it's called Christian, because it's Christ in you, Christ in me. The, the, this is about Jesus' work in me. Paul says, Christ in you is the hope of, of glory. Uh, in fact, in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, Paul puts it this way. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, in other words, we were rescued by God the deliverer, how much more now that we're reconciled shall we be saved, shall we be rescued by his life? His spirit is in us to empower us. Um, I used to have this little, um, this little trick that I used to do at night when I was uh, taking my shower uh, uh, look at the slot, just kidding. But, uh, but anyway, I, I used to have this little trick and I would, um, and, and, and I, you know, cause I like to brush my teeth when I'm taking my shower and I know that already you've got more information than you wished for. But, um, but anyway, I used to have this little trick where after I finished brushing my teeth, I would sort of do a hook shot with my toothbrush over the shower rod. And if I arced it just right, I could land it in the sink. And, uh, and, um, and, and, and so I would work on this every night and, and, and sometimes I would nail it and, and, and sometimes I would miss and, and, and sometimes um, I would bean Maggie in the head, uh, which she didn't find amusing. And anyway, one night I was, this was a long time ago, I can't remember, but this is back when everybody just used regular toothbrushes. I, you know, did my hook shot, lobbed it over, trajectory looks great, arc is perfect, it lands right in the sink but it's too hard, it bounces out, Maggie does not tip it in, and instead, it comes out on the floor. Next thing you know, though, we hear this humming sound, like this buzzing sound, we don't, we don't, we don't know what it is, so I turn off the shower, because I think, oh, maybe it's, maybe it's like a, one of the pipes, that, that didn't stop it, so then Maggie turns off the fan in the bathroom, I think maybe it's something with the fan, that doesn't stop it, we still hear this hum, and that's when we realized it was my toothbrush, that I had, completely unaware, bought my very first electric toothbrush, <laughs> and didn't know it. So, so all this time, I had been brushing my teeth with this toothbrush, just kind of brushing it, trying to clean my teeth, when the whole time there was a power inside the toothbrush of which I was completely unaware. And men and women, this is the way some of us live our Christian lives. We are trying so hard to brush and scrub and get all the sin decay out of our lives, and we can't do it. God has given a power his Holy Spirit, the person of the Spirit who lives in us, who lives in us. In fact, Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Now there's the power in the toothbrush. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when we pray, Lead us not into temptation. We can pray with confidence that, that our Father's not trying to trick us. He's not trying to trap us. He's leading us. He's loving us. He's, he's living in us so that we can be rescued from temptation. And, and, and we need, we need, 
brothers and sisters to hear that word this morning uh, because there, there are folks right here in this room. You look, you look great from where I'm standing, but I know, I know the stories. We live these lives. We know what it's like that, that some of us are bound up and we're trapped by anger and by, and by bitterness and by pride and by anxiety and by hopelessness and by patterns that the world has convinced us that we somehow just need to conform to and this stuff is killing us. And we pound away, pound away, trying to clean up our lives when it can only be done by Christ in us. This prayer reminds us that we can come to our Father with confidence and with humility and say, Lord, lead me not into testing. That's great news. But if the first part of verse 13 brings us good news, the second part of verse 13 um, brings us uh, some, some bad news. Uh, Jesus' prayer, look at it. He, he reminds us that uh, there is an enemy, an evil one, who in fact desires nothing more than to lead us into temptation. And, and, and that's why in Matthew chapter 6, verse 13, Jesus doesn't just tell us, uh, ask the Father not to lead us into temptation. He adds this second phrase, ask the Father to deliver us from temptation. Evil. Now, when you just read it the way we read it a few minutes ago in the English Standard Version, uh, in many, many Bibles, it simply says deliver us from evil. Um, however, uh, if you actually look in the Greek New Testament, there is an article. The word the is in the text. And, and so most Bible scholars agree that what we really should be praying is deliver us from the evil one. Deliver, deliver us from Satan. Deliver us from the one whose very name means uh, adversary. It means, it means opponent. So that we're talking here about a very, very serious adversary. Now, uh, I, I'm sure there are folks here this morning, when you think of, of Satan, you think of uh, you know, a mascot sitting on a goalpost at the end of the field or, or, or something like that. Um, I, when, when, um, when my brother and I were really little boys, uh, my mom, for nine summers straight took us down to Tallahassee, Florida, uh, because she was working on her master's degree in early childhood education at Florida State University. And, and so we had to go down there uh, every summer so she could take her classes. And dad had to stay back and work up in Charlotte. And, and so you can imagine what it would be like if you're trying to study and read, and then you've got these two little boys that you got to deal with, one of whom is very ill-behaved, my brother. And, uh, and, and, uh, and so what do you do? Well, my mom uh, came up with an idea. It was a pretty good idea. What she did was there was a lake right outside of Tallahassee called Lake Bradford. It's this beautiful spring-fed, crystal-clear lake. Uh, it's gorgeous cypress trees hang out over the lake, Spanish moss. Uh, you can literally see gators on the other side of the lake. Like my mom would say, you boys race across. But, but uh, I mean, uh, and, and, and so what she did was um, she bought for, she would take us out there to Lake Bradford and she bought for me and my brother rubber knives. And every guy in here, you know what I'm talking about, those rubber knives with the red handle, like the red rubber handle, and then kind of a painted uh, rubber silver blade. And then my brother and I, while my mom studied, we would spend the afternoon killing each other. And, uh, and, and so he, he would come over and, you know, uh, we'd be out on the dock, let, let's say, and he would, uh, you know, savagely uh, disembowel me. And, and, and then I would go, ah, 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 ah. And then I'd fall off into the water. And then I'd get up on the dock and it was my turn to kill him. And, uh, and, and, and it was awesome. And it was the way our mom taught us about the sanctity of life. And, and uh, you know what, you're laughing, but we were very good with rubber knives. Uh, in fact, to this day, I'm convinced that if I ever get mugged by somebody with a rubber gun, I can take him. But, but you know what made that fun? Is that we knew it was just pretend. Those knife fights on the dock at Lake Bradford, what made it fun is we knew this was just a play fight. Nobody was going to get hurt. What is glaringly clear, men and women, when we look in the scripture, is that our warfare with the evil one is not a play fight. He is the arch tempter. Remember Paul's warning in Ephesians 6, verse 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. In fact, we're given a very, very vivid picture 
in Luke chapter 4 of Jesus being led by the Spirit into the wilderness during which he has a showdown. He is tempted by this evil one. In fact, a lot of Bible scholars even wondered if maybe what we're reading here in Jesus' prayer in Matthew chapter 6 is in some ways a response to his experience in the wilderness. Because if you put both of these passages uh, side by side, it's kind of intriguing. Uh, for example, in Luke 4, in the temptation narrative, uh, Satan starts off by taunting Jesus, command these stones to become bread. Well, then in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prays what? Give us this day our daily bread. Then back in the temptation narrative, uh, Satan tries to tempt Jesus by calling on him to uh, leap from the pinnacle of the temple. And, and Jesus cites the commandment, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. Well, in the Lord's prayer, Jesus prays what? Lead us not into temptation. And then a third time in the temptation showdown, uh, the scripture says Satan uh, showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and said, this can all be yours if you will bow before me. And Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, what does he teach his disciples to pray? Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. I don't know if that's intentional or it just kind of happened. But here's what we do know about the evil one. Is that he's a master temper. He is the father of lies. We are never in all of the Bible warned of Satan's power. But we are frequently warned of his wiles, his, his strategies, his ability to make unrighteousness sound reasonable, to disguise darkness as, as light, his ability to make disobedience seem like the only uh, progressive option. Listen for it. You will hear it every day on the news, in your classroom, at work, in the newspaper, even in the church. The evil one, the tempter, is so, so seductive in his lives. I, I love the way uh, Lee Strobel depicts this in practical terms, a little parable he composed about a daughter and her boyfriend going out for a Coke on a school night. And so the father says to her, you must be home before 11. You must be home before 11. But you know how this works, right? We've all been there. It gets to be 1045. And uh, the young woman and her boyfriend are having a fantastic time. They don't want the evening to end. So suddenly they begin to have difficulty interpreting the father's command. Uh, what did he really mean when he said, you must be home before 11? Did he literally mean us? Oh, is he talking about you kind of in a general sense, like people in general, like you really need to be home before uh, 11? Uh, or was he just making the observation that generally people are home before 11? I mean, he really wasn't, he really wasn't very clear, was he? And, and what did he mean by you must? You must be home before 11. I mean, would a loving father really be that narrow and, and that inflexible? He probably just, he probably meant it as a suggestion. Like it, it might be a good, like I know he loves me and, and implicit therefore is that he wants me to have a good time. And if this is a good time, then he probably wants me to just stay out as long as I want. Certainly not to end the evening so soon. And what did he mean by you must be home before 11? I mean, he didn't specify Who's home? And, 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 you know, it could be anybody. So maybe, maybe he kind of meant it figuratively, right? Remember the old saying, home is where the heart is. And my heart is right here with you. And so I guess I'm home. <laughs> uh, oh, and what did he really mean when he said, you must be home before 11? Before, like, like, did he mean like exact literal sense I mean, besides, he never specified 11 p.m. or 11 a.m., right? I mean, he wasn't even really clear on, on which time zone. Uh, I mean, there's central time, there's eastern time. If you think about it, in California, it's only quarter to seven. And, uh, and, and so we're doing pretty good. And, and, and as a matter of fact, when you think about it, it's kind of always before 11, right? I mean, whatever time it is, it's always before the next 11. Uh, and, and, and you've got all these ambiguities and, and who's to actually say, and let's don't be so narrow-minded and judgmental and think that we are the only ones that understand this thing. So let's don't think for a minute that God's gonna hold us responsible to obey his command. All of us in this room, we know only too well the capacity of the evil one to woo us and wow us and welcome into a place, welcome us into a place of disobedience to declare right what God 
has declared wrong. No wonder, no wonder Jesus prays, deliver us, which literally in the Greek means snatch us, snatch us, deliver us from the evil one. So this, uh, this sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer comes to us as one petition, two parts. One is a word of promise. One is a word of warning. Let's think about both of them as we wrap it up this morning. Uh, we're going to begin with the word of warning. We're reminded in the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer that, that um, our faith will be tested. Our faith will be tested. Luke, in his gospel, uh, makes this one of his major themes. In fact, you remember the parable of the soils where Jesus talks about uh, the seed, some of which falls on the rock. And, and it's a reference to those of us who at first uh, hear the word and we receive it with joy. Everything's going fantastic. But then he goes on to say, and he uses the exact same Greek verb we see in Matthew 16, Ma Matthew 6, 13, that because we have no root, we believe for a while, we believe for a while, and then in a time of pyrosmo, in a time of testing, we fall away. That's a good warning. That's a good warning. Even here this morning, the Christian life is not easy. Living in the world we do, immersed in the culture that we are, our faith is going to be tested. So we need to have a strong spiritual root system. It needs to be rooted in the word. It needs to be rooted in a community of believers, just like Faith Bridge. It needs to be something that's nurtured and watered by fellowship with a small group and by time in prayer. Because if we don't root our faith, it will be tested and tried and it will fall away. Because you know what? There will be tests. There will be tests of our faith. But that warning also comes with a great promise. And I want to say this to the end so that you can think about it as you leave. This promise is that the Father is not going to lead us into any temptation that we cannot overcome by the power of his spirit in us. Paul makes this very clear. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he's not saying there won't be temptation, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may endure. You know why? Because he's the deliverer. He's a deliverer. On the night uh, of Jesus' arrest, so this would, have been, this would have been the night before the day that he was nailed to the cross, he gathered his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember this scene, many of you. And he gave them there a solemn warning. And you read about it in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. He said, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. It must have been very, very sobering words to hear. But what's striking to me is that um, only a few hours earlier in that very same evening, in fact, a few verses earlier in that very same chapter of Matthew, back in verse 26, we see Jesus taking bread. And after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples. And as he said, he gave it to them and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took a cup. When he took the cup, he gave thanks for them and for their life and for God's love. And then he said this, drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What blows me away when I read these words is that even at that point, Jesus must have known that at least two of the people in the room to whom he was preparing to serve the supper, two of those people were gonna betray him within the next 12 hours. But you know what's stunning? You know what's stunning? Is that he still said specifically, drink of it, all of you. All of you. Not, not, not everybody, but you two guys. All of you, drink of it. It's a measure, isn't it, of his love and his grace that he extended the bread and the cup even to his betrayers. Now, I'm not going to pretend to know why he did that. Uh, I, I think it might have been, frankly, because, first of all, Jesus is a high priest who understands our temptation. He, he was fully human. He understood what all of us here this morning understand, that, that in fact, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. But I also think, I think it might have been his hope that night, 
even at that late hour, that these would-be betrayers might yet be delivered from the lies of the tempter. And of course, looking back on the story now, we know that's exactly for one of them, precisely what happened. Now, Judas, Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. We know that. I'm sure he thought this is going to make me rich, but we know it was a very short while after that he realized that he is so empty in his soul that he, he, he didn't even want to keep living. But Peter, Peter, he ended up repenting of his sin and becoming uh, the rock that Jesus knew he could be the rock of faith in the church. He was complete turnaround. This morning, we're going to actually approach this very same table that we read about in Matthew. And as we share the bread and the cup together this morning, I want us to recognize that every single, this is so important, every single one of us in this room is going to eventually make one of those two choices. We will either walk away with Judas or we will fall before Jesus in repentance and confession. This morning, those of you who have made that choice, those of you who are followers of Christ, regardless of your denomination, um, we want to invite you. We want to invite you by God's grace to partake of this bread and this cup. Um, we, we want to encourage you as you uh, take the bread and the cup this morning to consider the instructions that we've been listening to in God's word through the voice of his rescuer. Uh, ask the Father. Don't, don't just pile up empty phrases or empty deeds as you receive the elements. Ask the Father to deliver you from temptation. He knows your weaknesses. Admit to him, confess to him, Lord, I'm facing this at work or I'm facing this with a friend or I'm facing this in a relationship and I know I can't pass the test. I need you. I need you to deliver me. Or maybe what you need to do is simply say, Lord, deliver me from the, the evil one. Deliver me from the evil one because you sense it. You sense his oppression. It's in your head, the haunting, the accusation, the fears. You cannot escape it, the guilt, and you need to be delivered by the one who declared death to our enemy. And above all, above all, don't be afraid this morning to bring your betrayals to this table. He knows the spirit is willing. He knows the flesh is weak. Find your refreshment, feed your hunger, restore your strength in this bread and in this cup. This morning, as we uh, share in this time of communion, uh, we want to make clear again, it's open to all believers. We're going to use uh, intention, which simply means you'll come up and you'll grab one of these gluten-free wafers and you will dip it into the cup. Uh, at that point, uh, you can uh, receive the elements. Uh, if you'd like to stay up here and continue to pray, that's fantastic. We want to make this uh, place open to you. Uh, if you want to go back to your seat and pray or just sit quietly, you can do that. We would ask that you respect the fact that this is a, 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 a sacred time. God is present with us. And so, and so um, let's respect the privacy and the quiet of those who want to stay and pray and, and do business uh, with God here in the front. Um, the ushers will, uh, by each row, invite you at, when you are supposed to come forward so you'll know when to come and receive the uh, elements. And then when you're ready to go back to your seat, you may do so. Um, as you're prepared together to share in this great supper, um, this rehearsal for the wedding feast of the Lamb, let's, let's pray together. Gracious God, our deliverer and our rescuer. We remember that day on the cross when your body was broken on our behalf. And this morning when we take the broken bread, we remember your suffering for us. We remember how you allowed yourself to be broken for our sin. That you lived a life that was absolutely sinless and died a death on our behalf for those of us who are so very sinful. Lord, you are indeed a rescuer, a redeemer. You are our deliverer. And then when we take the cup, we're reminded, Lord, of your blood that was shed on the cross, that that blood cleanses us from sin. We can't do it by ourselves. All of our wasted effort is not gonna get rid of the sin decay in our lives, not gonna do anything to prevent the cavities that build up when we ignore the Father's cleansing by the blood. 
I pray, Lord, that as we take these elements, that you would, through them, minister to us, serve us with your grace. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Duffy Robbins, who just came back with us for the second Sunday in a row yep. uh, to deliver a message called Lead Us Not Into Temptation, Deliver Us from evil. Right. Um, yeah, so we looked at this last section of the Lord's Prayer today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so we had one question that came around, uh, which is kind of a clarifying question. Yeah, it's a good um, question, too. It is a good question. So uh, the question says, why would Jesus pray for the Father not to lead us into testing when James says to consider testing per pure joy? And that this sentiment is also repeated throughout the New Testament. So 1 John, 1 Peter. It seems like that we should want to look forward to testing, not to avoid it. Right, right. No, I, I think the logic of the question it makes perfect sense. But, but um, here's a couple of comments. First of all, James does say, Consider joy, my brothers, when you meet various trials, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. But he never says, he never says, you know, pray for trials. Mm. Um, and, 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 and in fact, um, it would in a way be a little bit, uh, a little bit ludicrous. It wouldn't be taking trials seriously. Like, I, I, like um, I, I think I know people who have grown through cancer. They, they, they will say, I have become a deeper person through cancer. Uh, but, they're not, but, but they're not saying, so you ought to pray, you're going to have cancer, you know? Mm -hmm. Or I know, I, I don't know if this is true medically, but I've heard people say when a bone breaks, it grows back stronger. Mm -hmm. Let's just assume that's true. You, you, you're not going to say, hey, I really need more strength in my left leg, so I think I'll break it in several places. You know, so, so in, in a sense, uh, to recognize, James says, when you meet various trials, consider it a joy. He's saying, this is, this is an attitude I am to maintain in the trials because I know, in a sense, there's a silver lining to the, what appears to be a very dark cloud. But he's not saying that you should pray that you will have trials. Another way to think about it, I guess, is to, there, there's, a, there's a book by a guy named Gene Edwards called um, Tale of Three Kings, and the subtitle is A Study in Brokenness. And when I've read that book and when I've talked about it with my students, um, I will often say to them, I don't know if you're really prepared for your best ministry until you've gone through a time mm. of intense brokenness. But at the same time, I usually say to them, I'm not praying that God will take me through such a time. I'm just acknowledging that there are parts of my life that won't get excavated mm. unless I face those times. And I think in a sense, when we pray these words, uh, lead us not into testing in Matthew 6, 13, what we're also saying is, Lord, I'm not so conceited or so arrogant as to think, hey, bring it on, dude. Mm -hmm. I can handle whatever you got. Yeah. It's going to be joy in me. Just bring it on. And there's mm -hmm. a humility that says, look, Lord, please don't put me to the test. Yeah, I, I'm, I mean, weak. I'm, not, I'm weak. Yeah, I'm weak. Right. <laughs> so, so it said, I'm not, I know you, you can be trusted. Uh, and I know you will only lead me where a father would lead a child, hmm. but I, I'm, I'm, lead me not in the temptation, lead me not in the testing. So, so to sort of, you know, to say, well, you know, why don't we pray this more? Is it, it's, it's because we take suffering seriously. We're not Gnostics. We don't believe, well, that's just my body. This is me. M me, I am my body. And so my body is broken. That hurts. And I mm -hmm. take pain seriously. God takes our pain seriously. But in the midst of our pain, mm -hmm. he can bring, ironically, great healing. Mm -hmm. And so we can count it a joy when we meet various trials. Mm -hmm. But we're encouraged, you know, Lord, if possible. Jesus himself said, let this cup pass from mm -hmm. me. So that, that would be my response to the question. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, today's message was great and 
uh, Venture Sunday was super fun. Very fun. Super fun. And so it's always a joy to have you with us here, Duffy. We can't wait for you to come back again. Looking forward to it. Thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us today for Postscript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.